How do you spot bad fitness advice, bad nutrition advice, a fake expert, someone that's maybe more of a charlatan? How do you kind of figure these things out? Well, I've compiled a list of 13 things that I've seen commonly online. That way you can look for these patterns. Generally speaking, once you learn these sort of 13 things, it's kind of hard to unlearn it. And you start recognizing who's really pulling your leg and who's not. And a lot of people have really good intentions and are just making mistakes. That's a completely different ballgame from people that are intentionally misleading people for some kind of gain, right? So let's go ahead and jump right in. And after today's video, I went ahead and put a link to one of our sponsors. But yes, this channel has sponsors and I disclosed that. But it is for Create creatine gummies. So these are gummies that are sweetened with allulose, so they're not going to have this huge glycemic impact. There's one and a half grams of creatine per gummy. So you can take one gummy, you can take two gummies, so you can sort of microdose your creatine and get you to the right level where you want to be, and therefore minimize some of the water retention that might come with it. Now that link down below gets you 50% off. So we're talking a pretty serious deal there. So 50% off discount link using that link down below in the top line of the description. So if you take creatine, literally one of the most studied ergogenic aids that is out there. So one of the things we're gonna talk about in today's video is evidence. Do they talk about evidence? And when you're talking about evidence, creatine has a lot of evidence, bottom line. So that link is down below, top line of the description. Number one is kind of an obvious thing. The content they create, the things they talk about, has absolutely no scientific literature behind it at all. Or they're not disclosing that it's anecdotal or possibly a hypothesis. It's okay to talk about blue sky territory. It's okay to talk about things that we wonder. It's okay to sort of connect dots here and there, but you wanna make sure that you're disclosing it. Hey, my anecdotal experience is this. Or hey, what I possibly think or what could be happening is, these are the kind of words you wanna look for. Could be, possibly, sometimes it's not sexy because it's not, this is the absolute way it is. If we were to say this is the absolute way it is, we would all be wrong because none of us know the absolute way that it is. Number two, they haven't changed their perspective in a very long time. We like conviction. When we look at content, we want to feel like we're part of a tribe. We want to feel like we're part of a community. So when people change their minds on things, it can get really frustrating because you feel like you're almost getting outcasted from your community that you've invested so much in. But the bottom line is when you're looking at real research and you're looking at real things that have to do with fitness and nutrition and even health, you have to be willing to change your perspective based on what you learn and also what the science starts to show. It's not always about quote unquote following science. It's about growing and learning new things that perhaps change your perspective. And if you're going to be a thought leader and you're going to give advice, you need to be honest with yourself and you need to be willing to change and pivot when that time comes. Number three, someone that is maybe someone you shouldn't follow is someone that finds everyone else wrong. There are a number of these people online. Everyone else is wrong and you need to listen to them because they know the secret sauce. They had someone come to them in the middle of the night and secretly tell them everything about the universe and they are now president of the world. That's the exact kind of thing you don't want to follow, right? A true leader is someone that gets their hands dirty and actually works with their troops, with their people, right? And that's what you want in someone that is teaching you fitness advice. And again, I'm no saint. I have made my fair share of mess ups and I have been overly cavalier in some of my statements before. So you may not want to follow me, that's perfectly fine, but make sure that you follow someone that is a true leader, not someone that is just trying to make everyone else look bad. Number four, it's a constant game of connect the dots or drawing inference. Now, what do I mean by that? It's okay to connect dots like mechanistically now and then. So what that means is you say, okay, there's a small research uh, body over here that says this, and there's a small body of literature over here that says this. If that means that, and that means this, then maybe we could hypothesize that this is happening. That's actually a fun little ladder game to play. 
And there's nothing really wrong with it doing it for novelty, but you can't draw a true conclusion from that. So just be cautious with that because a lot of people that do that are perfectly good people, very smart people, very intellectual and greatly articulate people. And it doesn't mean you shouldn't follow them. This one is a little wishy-washy because you just have to use some caution and you have to be able to recognize when someone is playing, quote unquote, connect the dots. It's okay to do for hypothesis. It's just not something we want to lean into for concrete impact or result. Number five, they make a big deal out of small studies. Now, I have been guilty of this in the past. I have definitely talked about small scale studies with like eight people. And I still do talk about small studies, but the difference is when I talk about small studies now, they're to either reinforce something bigger, to talk about potential mechanisms that we might be learning, or to just sort of get an understanding of something. What you don't want is this giant magnum opus, huge piece of content, concrete, this is the way it is based on a four person study or some N of one. It's okay to acknowledge what it is, but be cautious of small studies and always look in the description for the PMIDs so that you can go over to PubMed and you can look at the study yourself. Even if you cannot read a scientific paper, it's pretty easy to scroll down and see what the sample size or the actual cohort is. Number six, they make you feel bad about the choices you're making. You've seen them going through the grocery store and basically telling you that you are responsible for all the bad things that are happening to you because you're choosing to eat this and you're choosing to eat that. We all know, we know that a lot of the power is within ourselves. Okay, we know when we're overeating, we know when we're making bad choices generally. We don't need someone to force us into submitting and ultimately surrendering to your amazing Instagram reels that are changing and saving the world, right? So if people are making you feel bad, it's usually a psychological game to get you to want to embrace what they have to say. Just use some caution there. There's a difference between tough love and a mind game. Number seven is not understanding statistical significance. Now this one gets a little bit in the weeds. We'll keep it pretty high level because I'm not a statistician, but it's still something that I think we need to know if we're going to talk about literature. So a lot of really well-intentioned, well-meaning people will talk about scientific literature online and they mean no malice whatsoever, but you have to use some caution when you look at content from someone that perhaps doesn't understand statistical significance or what is called a null hypothesis or an alternative hypothesis. Because statistical significance is really just measuring the probability of a null hypothesis or ultimately the status quo or zero effect. What, it, what that basically means is something can be statistically significant and actually not be that crazy of a result. It's just statistically significant. So it's just the probability of something different from a zero outcome or baseline. And I know that sounds complex and that's kind of my point. I don't even fully understand the statistics. That's not my world of expertise, but I've looked at enough papers now and I've consulted with enough statisticians to understand truly like what the null hypothesis is and what a good study is and what a bad study is. So just make sure that you know that they know what they're talking about by reviewing a lot of their content. Number eight is a quick one. If they tell you cardio doesn't matter, they're probably a green snake in green grass because cardio does matter. And any responsible person will also tell you that if you resistance train properly and fast, you can get a cardiovascular workout from that as well. So to tell you that cardio doesn't matter, that is just completely denying bodies of literature that are so hard to ignore. It's clear that there's an agenda there. Number nine is these fitness people that don't acknowledge non-exercise activity thermogenesis. Kind of a funny story. Uh, you guys know Greg Doucette on YouTube. Um, Greg and I go way back. We've had our beefs, we get along just fine, but I had posted something on Instagram that talked about how moving more and eating less may not be the answer long-term for weight loss. And I had a reason for saying that. And he commented, he's like, if that's not what it is, then tell me what it is. Because we know Greg is very big on calories in, calories out. So I said, oh great, okay, I triggered Greg, but he doesn't know my context here. So I actually sent him a message and we talked about it and he completely gets it. 
what I was talking about is it oftentimes is better to eat a larger amount of food so that you have more energy to move more throughout the day to ultimately wind up in more of a deficit. A lot of people say, oh, I'm just gonna not eat the brownie instead of doing cardio. Not that brownie would be my choice, but I would actually rather eat the brownie and do cardio because metabolically, that's actually better. I would rather have more fuel coming in and more fuel going out because overall, I'm ending up in a deficit either way, but non-exercise activity thermogenesis and moving outside of my cardio just by having more energy. My point in saying this is people that don't acknowledge how much you move throughout the day or your non-exercise thermogenesis, they're not looking at the whole picture because it is not simply in an echo chamber of cardio and just an isolated world of like what we eat and what's in a calorie tracker. There's more to it than that. Number 10, if they seem like they're seeking an extreme or they're outlandish, it's because they probably are. For entertainment value, people like extremes, so it's easy content to watch. But even those people that look at the extreme content, I would argue a large percentage of them never even apply it. They just like to watch it. But it becomes dangerous because then a small percentage of the people do want to do those things. Not saying that extreme things are bad, because some extreme things are great, but if they're like trying so hard, it's like, it's like when Liver King started and I'm not even gonna beef on Liver King, but like, like when he started eating liver and whatnot, all these other small timers started being like, I'm gonna be pancreas king, and I'm gonna be lung king, and I'm gonna be testicle king, and I'm gonna, so they wanted to just like eat all these different things to be extreme because they saw it working for Liver King. That's the kind of stuff you gotta watch out for. Number 11 is anyone that defends fats or carbs to the grave without any thoughtful acknowledgement of the other one. Right, so like there are people out there that will not, absolutely will not accept that ketosis is a real thing and that it is a perfectly healthy clinical thing and a perfectly healthy physiological state. And then there are people on the other side of the world that think every single carbohydrate possible is problematic and is a bad thing. Those people may not be bad intentioned, but they are clearly so closed-minded that you, you should not listen to them. Like Dr. Mike Isretel, loves his carbs, loves his carbs. He's all about high carb. When I had him on my channel and I was hanging out with him, he also was talking about the benefits of keto and how wonderful it was for fat loss and for mental clarity and how he loved keto too. That's the kind of thing you look at. There's a scientific rigor just in how they think about life. And then there's people like Dom Diagostino, hardcore keto guy, loves keto, lives keto, has been for 20 years, right? Deadlifts 700 some odd pounds after a five day fast while also being in ketosis on both ends of that. He acknowledges that, hey, you know what? Yeah, for performance, like carbohydrates, like there's no denying the literature's there. Like carbohydrates will aid top peak performance. That's what we need to look at. Anyone that defends one to the grave, just ignore them. Number 12 is a little bit more of a personal one. They don't resonate with you. Sometimes you come across these people that are just so good at delivering and explaining things to you in such a way that works for you. Like that's what has to click because sustainability is the answer. And the two part of this is that, well, anyone that doesn't acknowledge sustainability is key, probably shouldn't listen to them. So maybe you like listening to, I don't know, James Smith, because he's hilarious. Even though I don't agree with everything James says, I like to stop, watch his stuff because he's hilarious and that resonates with a lot of people. Maybe you like Huberman's approach because he's so detailed. Maybe you like Rhonda Patrick because she's very mechanistic sometimes. Maybe you like me because I'm a loser. I don't know. But bottom line is you have to find something that resonates with you. And the 13th and final one that's really important because it's important to mention that brands online and people online need to make money. So they're going to do so in different ways. So sponsorships, product mentions, things like that, they're going to be everywhere. What you need to look for is look for people that disclose it because that's how you know they're just being real. There's no shame in me having sponsors on my videos because I'll be authentic about it, I'll be real about it, and I'll let you know that there's a value exchange 
and I'll let you know that I'm being compensated to talk about a product that I like, and you can skip through it or not. But then you have people where the net impression of a video is by the product. Where you're like, you've watched the whole video, and you're like, I got nothing out of this video except for the fact that if I don't buy this product, I'm going to die. That's exactly what you have to look for. The other thing is look for people that actually disclose FTC, FDA disclaimers and disclose these things. Because those are the ones that are actually following it by the book and are probably gonna be around for a long time because they're not flying under the radar doing something shady. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.